Hi, Bill Mobley for the Brain Channel and uh, here at UCSD TV. Very pleased to have as a guest today Harvey Checkaway, who is a professor at uh, UCSD in the Department of Neurosciences, but also in family medicine and public health. Harvey has had a very distinguished career in which he's made important contributions to our understanding of a number of issues, one of which is uh, how pesticides, how toxins might be involved in causing neurologic disease. So, Harvey, welcome. Thank you. Very happy to have you here. Tell us a little bit about you and what you do. Okay, thank you. Pleasure to be here. Um, my training is in epidemiology, and I've been doing this for a number of years, mainly studying environmental factors for chronic diseases. I started out a lot in cancer research and respiratory disease, a lot of occupational health work, and if I can tell a little anecdote, I was interested in branching out, and I asked a colleague and friend of mine uh, who was a neurologist, I said, what, where do you think I should go? And he said, have you ever heard of MPTP? Mm -hmm. And I said, uh, no, what's that? He said, look it up. And I did, and as you know, that's the story of, that triggered all the environmental research into Parkinson's etiology, and it just got me hooked, and I've been at it for 20 plus years. Say a little bit more about, this is Bill Langston's uh, discovery yes. in the Bay Area. Yeah. Uh, the story is that somebody was trying to make um, uh, Demerol, I guess. Yeah, uh, yes. yeah. And they did a kind of a lousy job. Well, the way the story goes, and I've met with uh, Dr. Langston and yeah. talked about this, yeah. and his book is fantastic, by yeah. the way. It's called The Frozen Addicts. Interesting. But Bill, as he describes it, this was a community in the Bay Area, uh, Santa Clara area, where IV drug abuse was relatively common, and these folks thought they were injecting themselves with so-called synthetic heroin, yes. sort of a manufactured, uh -huh. mm -hmm. and it was contaminated with this chemical MPTP, right. big long chemical name. Right. And they developed irreversible Parkinsonian disease, and that really just triggered the field of environmental uh, research into Parkinson's. And it wasn't the typical course for Parkinson's disease. They went really from normal to full-blown PD Parkinsonism, Parkinsonism, I guess, yeah, Parkinsonism, yes. in a matter of a few days. Yeah, I mean, it, it was uh, almost like an acute poisoning. Right. And as it's described in the literature, this is irreversible. They had the brain lesions yeah. characteristic on, on death. Right. And this was a, a major trigger. There's another little story about that, that when Bill, I think it was Bill, went to the Stanford Library, the page in which the synthesis of this compound not this compound, but the intended compound, was torn out of one of the books. <laughs> it's as if somebody had gone to the library, pulled out that page, mm -hmm. and went on to essentially construct a toxin, not meaningfully, but uh, in fact construct a toxin. Mm -hmm. So mm -hmm. very powerful evidence that A goes to B. And then, and that, it makes it so much more plausible that people would say not only is it a toxin, but maybe we can learn how that toxin works. And maybe we can find a way to prevent the normal course of Parkinson's disease from, from playing out. So that's, that's what you're interested in. Absolutely, absolutely. So and tell us more about that. Well, uh, there's been a lot of research, basic lab research, animal experiments that have demonstrated that MPTP is indeed a good model. Uh, it's not something that we have every day in our lives. I mean, it, it was a very unique cir circumstance, but there are a number of pesticides that are structurally similar to it, and one that does stand out is, is the herbicide Periquat. Mm. And uh, people started thinking, well, maybe pesticides are linked with Parkinson's. There has been a ton of research. I've participated in a fair bit of it. Um, it's been uh, a very interesting, challenging uh, story, trying to find out what are the etiological factors environmentally. And there is no simple answer that Paraquad or pesticide X we know causes Parkinson's. It's, it's still a complex story. It, why is it complicated? Is it complicated because real people uh, use the herbicide and have a varying degree of exposure? Or is it complicated because the biology is complicated? Or, or, there, or have there been roadblocks to discovering uh, what Paraquat really does? Well, I think, um, and I'll defer to the basic uh, neuroscience folks about this, but yeah. my understanding is that Parkinson's is not a simple disease. It's mm -hmm. not as though you, 
with the exception of the MPTP episode, mm -hmm. it, it's not as though you get injected with a virus and then you get it. Right. Uh, it's a complex disease. It has many manifestations. So what we're seeing, and we're studying people who work with Paraquat, uh, work with DDT, work with a whole host of things. And by the way, most people that handle it or work with it, even around our homes, don't just use one chemical. It's a yes, mixture of things. Yes. And they have different modes of action. It's a very complex story. It's a, you know, it's sort of X is a moving target and yeah. Y is a moving target. Yes. So that's hard. And so the exposure, the types of exposures, the intensity of exposure, all that makes this research more, more difficult. I guess the other thing you have to figure in is, you know, I might be exposed today, but this is not MPTP. I might get sick 20 years from now. Mm -hmm. And how do I link that period of 20 years in a plausible, tangible way to my first exposure? That's a challenge. And one of the challenges we have, obviously, we don't walk around with monitors measuring mm -hmm. what we do and what we're exposed to. Mm -hmm. In a <clears throat> maybe perfect experimental world, we would do that, but yeah. obviously we don't. Yeah. Uh, and I th a lot of it, we have to rely on what people tell us they've used and what uh, they tell us they've done. For instance, uh, we've done a lot of work with welders. Hmm. And welding is another occupation that has risks of Parkinsonian <laughs> disease or symptoms, probably due to manganese. Mm -hmm. The welders know a lot about their work. It's very predictable. Uh, but if you try to study agricultural workers, mm -hmm. their jobs are changing all the time. Mm -hmm. They're moving from field to field, crop to crop. And you ask the average worker, what are you handling? And it's, mm -hmm. we're handling what we're given. Mm -hmm. In fact, we did a study some years ago in Washington State where we uh, studied the orchard owners. Uh, Washington was a big apple, now it's grapes, but it was a big apple growing area in the central part of the state. And we asked the orchard owners, tell us what herbicides and, and insecticides you used. And most of the answers were, um, uh, you know, whatever was licensed. We would mm. give them a list of chemical names or even product names and they'd say, I don't know, it's whatever, whatever was approved. So there's a lot of ambiguity about what are people actually exposed to? Uh, and mm. it, it's hard to figure out. And you, I think if you're an orchard owner, uh, maybe it's understandable that you don't know what you're applying because for you it's just stuff, I guess. The company sold me the stuff and I can use this much of the stuff. And it, but it, it's, it's sad because, because if there's any harm caused by anything they're spreading, then ultimately there's a kind of an obligation to not only know what you're spreading, but how much you're spreading, mm -hmm. how often you're spreading it, and then how much the individual worker is going to be contaminated, intoxicated by this. It's very hard to get a good handle on because some people have appropriate protection yes. uh, for the pesticides. Uh, they have gloves and they wear yeah. respiratory protections and so forth. Others are out there in t-shirts and shorts yeah. and, um, you know. Well, one thing about California, um, which is good, there are very good records of spraying mm -hmm. history. So we, we can go back 20, 30 years and identify what was sprayed and in what quantities. Mm -hmm. That doesn't give you a complete picture of what you got and what I got, but we know what our community got. Right. And if you look on a broad population level, are the rates a Parkinsonian disease or symptoms higher in heavily sprayed regions mm -hmm. versus mm -hmm. uh, low sprayed regions. Well, it, it, the epidemiology field is one where you have to collect a lot of different pieces of information. You have to, I mean, it, it's not just uh, what we've been speaking about, but you know, how close were you to this field when it was sprayed? Mm -hmm. uh, did you bring the material home with you? To what extent were your, is it in the carpeting? To what extent are your, are your, uh, your young children who, mm -hmm. and for whom everything goes in their mouth, how, how, were, how were they exposed? Uh, what about well water? What about the water we're drinking? So there's so many, I wouldn't say imponderables, but they're certainly complicated 
uh, elements that you, an epidemiologist has to bas basically account for. Absolutely, and uh, one issue we've had, mentioned our research on welders, these are professional welders in the Midwest that we've been studying for a number of years. Mm -hmm. um, I've also discussed possibly studying welders here, right in San Diego, in the shipyards, right. yeah. uh, met with the union representatives, leadership, and they're very on board, but they said, you know, frankly, the welders aren't worried about, they're pretty well protected. Their families are worried because they're coming home with stuff all over their clothes and shoes and the kids are getting exposed to it. So Very it, interesting. the secondhand exposure is, can be a, a key issue for a lot of people. How, how do you measure that? So, so they, I don't know, welders wear overalls, I guess. Oh, yeah, yeah. They have masks oh, and all sure. kinds of stuff. Yeah. How is it that they protect themselves on the job? Well, typically they have respiratory protection because it's, it's airborne exposure. Mm -hmm. So it's mm -hmm. uh, pretty straightforward. Although sometimes if you go to some work sites, you'll see some of the the people welding wearing the kind of masks you can buy in the you know the supermarket. Oh, you know, so there's little. Yeah, yeah. But most welders are professional welders are protected pretty well. Uh, the issue though is how are they protecting? themselves when they bring it home. Can they change their clothing? Uh, can they take a shower at the end of the day? Yeah. Are they willing to do that? Yeah. And, and so forth. So if you were going to do a study among those people, presumably you'd like to know the answers to all those questions. And, and certainly the, you know, the, the, the worry you would have is that you come home, there's something on your clothes, no, mm -hmm. nothing's perfect, and you know you, and it, and the stuff that's on your clothes drops on the f carpeting, and your little one-year-old or your 18-month-old goes about playing on the carpeting and taking little play toys and sticking them in mm -hmm. his mouth or her mouth. I mean that that could be a pretty substantial dose. That can be a huge dose in some instances. In fact, there are pretty well established methods of measuring uh, exposures in the home. And yes. I have colleagues that I work with who do a lot of mass spec chemistry. Oh. You can take dust samples. Mm. You take a little vacuum cleaner into the homes. Tell people, don't do anything different. We're just yeah. going to come in on Wednesday. Yes. And we're going to take a little vacuum sample here and there and there. Uh -huh. And we'll measure uh, what's in the home. Right. It could be pesticides. It could be metals, a variety of things. Interesting. And so the future of this kind of research then, it sounds like, uh, focuses on increasingly accurate methods for examining exposure, at least at one level, understanding the biology of exposure at the level of neurons and brain stuff, and then finally, the social value of saying, now that we know what exposures look like, mm -hmm. here are the rules you have to have if you want to protect people. Is that fair? Oh, absolutely. Yeah. And the, the other issue is that, and I'm Pretty typical, I think, of a lot of epi, epidemiology people right. who got into this area. Right. You study diagnosed diseases, so mm -hmm. um, you do research. You have patients who have been diagnosed with Parkinson's. You have other people who don't have that condition, yeah. but that's way downstream. And I mm -hmm. think, in terms of the protection of mm -hmm. health, we want to find early symptoms, yeah. early in, early clinical indicators. Yes. And I rely on. You and your colleagues, Dr. Litvan and others, yeah. who've developed very good methods for identifying, pre, you know, preclinical symptoms, mm -hmm. uh, and if you can intervene at that point and say, you don't have Parkinson's disease and you may never get it, but you have a little bit of a slow gait or you have a little bit of a tremor. Yes. Uh, let's look into this. Maybe we can, mm -hmm. you know, reduce your exposure. That's key. And even better. You know, uh, we have measured parts per million of manganese or paraquat or compound X, and we know that there's a certain probability that you will have a problem from this, and so our strong advice to you is stop welding, stop spraying, or something. That would be really cool to do. I'm but sure by the same, But that. by the same token, uh, and I <clears throat> have very strong ties with my welder community, yeah. Um, it's very skillful work. They yes. do great work. They get paid, I think, quite well. Yeah. And it, it's tough to, se to se oh. tell somebody, uh, give up your yeah. profession. I can imagine. I can imagine. Exciting, frustrating, and very important. 
Harvey, thanks for being with okay, us. Okay, well, thank you, Bill. Good to Pleasure. talk to you. Okay. Good to talk to you. Okay. Thanks for watching On Our Mind. <laughs>